I built an operating system for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Why? I think a better question might be, how? An operating system is a program that sits on top of the hardware of a computer and allows other programs to interact with a computer without having to worry about communicating directly with the physical components of it. But the Nintendo Entertainment System, otherwise known as the family computer in Japan, like many other home computers of that day, did not come with an operating system. Rather, games were written directly in instructions that the CPU executed on demand. During the era of the NES, other machines, like the Apple II, did have operating systems that you could boot onto your computer, like DOS. But it wouldn't be until Apple took the idea of the graphical user interface in Xerox that we would get operating systems that looks like something that runs on our computers today. Since the NES was a game machine and not a home computer, it's no wonder no one ever created a dedicated operating system for it. That is until today. I'm going to create the NES OS, or as I like to call it, NESOS. It's not going to be a command line based operating system like DOS, because one, the system doesn't have any disk drives, so I'd have to call it ROS or something like that. And two, something like that would work great for being a basic writing machine, but there's already a program called Family Basic that does that already. No, Nisos will have an interactive GUI with two core applications, the word processor and the settings. I want Nisos to be like an actual operating system that Nintendo might have made back in the day for the NES. What would it have looked and felt like? I think it would be something like this. An NES program is essentially a virtual game cartridge that is set up in the same way, being mostly dedicated to the program ROM, where the game code is stored, and the character ROM, where the graphics are stored. So I'm bringing out my boilerplate file to get started. I did wind up debugging it for a good hour or so, but eventually I got it to correctly compile, and was able to write out this message here in sprites. I had a little trouble at first trying to get the color palette right, but eventually I found the rope command I was filling everything up, and here we are. If you're wondering what this mini Kirby is doing here, that's the cursor for the OS. And yes, he does like being in the files. And no GUI would be completely without an iconic background, just like this. No, 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 close. Yes, this one here. These are the kanji for Nintendo, and I made it look similar to the modern Nintendo logo by putting this ring around it, and I don't think it looks half bad. After that, I added the taskbar and this reset button. This is the equivalent of putting the physical reset button on your system, just in digital form instead. And the desktop is pretty much done, at least in terms of layout. So now I'm going to begin to write the first app to the system, the word processor. So how does this work? As a quick review, the character ROM of my virtual game cartridge is broken into two sections of 256 sprites each. One section for foreground sprites, and one section for background sprites. However, the NES can only display 64 foreground sprites at a time. These sprites are all only 8x8 eight eight pixels, but can be moved together to represent larger entities like a Mario or a file. Using foreground sprites would mean that I could have it max 64 characters in a text document, a pitiful amount considering this sentence has 163 characters in it. Luckily, the NES also has background sprites. These background sprites must remain on a grid system and are represented by only a single byte in memory, referencing one of 256 possible background characters. But the whole background can be covered, providing much more than 64 characters to write. And so, not counting the taskbar area, or the area that gets cut off and isn't visible, the text file will be able to have 832 characters in it. Now let's remember that the NES controller only has 8 buttons, and not the 101 keys found on the standard keyboard, and not the 88 keys found on the standard piano. So how is typing going to work? Well, the NES does have a keyboard, or at least the Japanese version of the NES, the Famicom. Don't forget that these two systems are actually one and the same, with only a few minor differences. One of which is that the Famicom's controllers were plugged directly into the board, and couldn't be unplugged by the user at will. But it did have a 15-pin expansion port on the front of the console that it used for things like the zapper gun. Whereas in the NES, the 8-pin controller port acted as the expansion port for those sorts of things. That means, thanks to the magic of online wikis and extensive debugging, Nisos is compatible with the family-based keyboard. Running a small business takes grit and determination and a fast, reliable communication solution from Spectrum Business. Just $49.99 a month for 300 megabits per second internet when bundled with Spectrum Business Connect plus a free mobile line. All from Spectrum Business. And as you can see, it works rather well. I'm assigned to add 64 technical characters to the word processor. These letters here are the same font as found in Super Mario, and these other characters here are building blocks that the user can use to make fun shapes and designs. 
Given that the family basic keyboard has 72 keys on it, that means there are 8 extra keys that aren't assigned a certain background character. These extra keys are all given unique functions in the word processor. The arrow keys move the cursor around the screen freely. The delete key of course deletes the last character. The return key prints the last character printed. The clear key clears the screen. And the escape key closes the program and returns the user to the desktop. NES users, on the other hand, will have to type these characters with the buttons on the controller like this. A types the letter you want to print, and B access the spacebar. Holding A cycles through the letters that can be typed. Holding select with A or B reverses the process. A cycles in reverse, and B moves backwards. Honestly, it sounds more complex than it actually is. Holding a controller it feels more intuitive, actually. And, of course, I have buttons on the screen for clearing, closing the program, and saving the file to the system. Now, where is my text data in memory right now? To understand that, we need to first understand that there are three processors in the NES. The central processing unit, the audio processing unit, and the picture processing unit. Because the latter of which, the key can be used, that deals with taking the type representing sprites and turning them into actual images. In order to do this job effectively, the PPU has been given its own dedicated RAM to do its work in. And the current background screen data, i.e. our text, is in that RAM that the PPU has exclusive access to, specifically in a section called a name table. And that's where I want it to stay. I thought about creating a copy of this data in the CPU's directly available memory. That way I could easily access this data, and I could even implement scrolling to make the document a little bigger even. But even just one screen's worth of data is 832 bytes. That's almost half of all the free memory in this 2K system, and a significant chunk of what's left after I had in variables, audio processing, and sprites. So I decided it best to limit file size to 832 bytes and make each file worth only one screen's worth of memory. And this brings us to how exactly we save data on the NES. Early NES games didn't have any save features, and the NES itself never had any memory on the system that games could write to and access save data. This is why some games would give you a code you could input to get you to a certain checkpoint in the game. But eventually, later cartridges became more advanced and provided the ability for data to be preserved between play sessions. It was stored on a special game called MD Game, which was itself in the cartridge, and was attached to a battery that kept the lights on in the ship too. Luckily, I don't have to worry about the particulars of physical cartridge design and computer chips because I'm creating a virtual game. All I have to do to say that this game has battery back RAM in it is to switch one value in my program. Then to save data to that chip, I just write data to the 8K of RAM located between 6,000 and 8,000. And since we have 8K of memory available, that's enough for 9 whole files of data, with a little left over. But I'm going to switch the number of files to 8, since it's just a nice number of times, and you never know when you might need more space to store. Remember that the text file is sitting by the CPU to this game. This means that the CPU can't see it directly. I have to politely ask the CPU to look at the address it's working on, then read the data one by the time looking at that same address. Whenever I save, I have to go through this process of getting the background of the data type by type and then writing it to the designated state and never. But once you do save this file, it shows up on the desktop, and then you can click on whatever file you want to load and see that this file really has been saved. Even if you use the machine, it's still all there. It also has a message for when you already have the file, and it shows that this is full and it won't be able to save it from the file. You have to go through or through these files and go to delete it. And that brings me to the which also comes from the final. I began with I.D. before, that means open I.D. looks like a window with the background of the desk, so visible. This is easy to do and to understand how to tell my name yet, but I just have to type the background so it's visible. The window is just different, and then the short is just kind of here. And then I can write out the text and the text in the desk. First of all, I need to show you the actual. And then I need to change the circle, the desktop color, and also the font. I need to get to the font that's going to be available. Then I want some system information, which is like the font that's going to be available, and the font that's going to be available, and the font that's going to be available. Now I need to change the circle, the desktop color, and the text each file exists. That's just out of the list. Adding functionality to the circle and background that isn't going to be called. I just keep track of single text and 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 text
不是一个小区的，很多人，嗯，你你早起的同时，他是你一直穿的，这个这个这个什么？And then I am the calculation for how much key memory is available. Since the file is a span of 832 bytes, it should subtract how much of that is available from the 8K of MD RAM. Before moving on to the settings, I added five more cursors, which are callbacks to some of the most notable games on the NES. From the beginning, here's the normal cursor, the mini trophy, a mushroom from Mario, Link's boomerang from the Legend of Zelda, a shuriken from the mysterious Murasano Castle, a tetramino block from Tetris, and a golf ball from Golf. And as for the background, there are 53 possible colors that the user can choose from. Basically, every color that the NES is capable of displaying. Then one last set things that really feel like an operating system is what if the user moves around the icons on the desktop. If the user scrolls over a file or program and touches D, then they can drag it around anywhere on the screen. So feel free to arrange your sounds wherever you want, and you can always take the app icons on the taskbar as well. Mesos 1.9, a 48 kilobyte operating system, is still a little bugged, but it's good enough for the public to experience. Just hit the reset button for that receipt to get the Follow the links down below to download a copy of Mesos and try it for yourself on your favorite emulator, the NES, or Sam Comic Shop. If you want to see more projects like this, then click subscribe. And until next time, thanks for watching. Well, thank you everyone for being here today, and I'd like to thank John for inviting me to participate in this important conference.